Okay, so the Book of Boba Fett is now officially over and the finale has a lot to unpack from it. Throughout this video, we're going to be breaking down the ending in Easter eggs, giving our thoughts on the series as a whole, and also talking about the things you missed. Yes, you, search your feelings, you know it to be true. Now from here on out, it's full spoilers ahead, so if you haven't had a chance to check it out, then I highly recommend that you check out now. I find your lack of likes disturbing, so please drop a thumbs up if you enjoy the video, and don't forget to subscribe for breakdowns like this each and every day. With that out of the way, let's set phases to pun, and get into the Book of Boba Fett, Mandalorian, Grogu training, Tatooine, Fennec, Shan show. Okay, so last week was pretty heavily focused on the Mandalorian, Luke Skywalker, and also Grogu. Boba Fett has pretty much just got to the point that he's standing around in silence, doing nothing, which, when you think about it, makes him exactly like how he was in the original trilogy. This is for the real fans. Now, Mando returned to Tatooine and joined up with his forces, and out in the desert, Cad Bane arrived to deliver a warning to the kind folks of Freetown. He shot the sheriff and also the deputy in order to make it clear that the pikes weren't messing around. Only Max Rebo was safe as the sanctuary was destroyed, and we ended the episode with Grogu having to make a tough choice. Will he remain to train as a Jedi, or will he go back to be with Mando? We'll get into it but that should have you fully caught up. Now we open on Mos Esper in the aftermath of the destruction of the Sanctuary. Amongst the runes, they talk about how prosperous that they want to make Mos Esper, and it very much juxtaposes the destruction that they stand amongst. Mando tells them of the deal that they made with Cobb Vanth, and how all they want is to stop the spice from flowing. Boba realises that it's destroying everyone's lives, and he puts the people above profits. This idea of staying close to those in Mos Esper is furthered hammered home by the fact that Fed agrees to remain at the bar rather than going back to his palace. The name of the bar is of course the Sanctuary, and this very much takes on a literal meaning as the war plays out. Now we cut to Cad Bane eyeing up some Jawas like he's Pelimoto, and he joins the Pike leader that we met earlier in the season in Mos Eisley. Along with him is the Mayor, who according to his Major Domo, was on a scheduled vacation. He's Ted cruising for a bruising, and it's all politics as we learn the Pikes were the ones that killed the Tuscans. They framed the Nictos, and we got our first fan theory wrong here, as I thought that Cad would have done it. However, it was pretty obvious that the bikers weren't behind it, as Fennec did say they wouldn't have had the manpower to take them all out. Pretty much got every fan theory wrong, to be fair, and even the reports about a de-aged Han Solo showing up turned out to be untrue. It's untrue. All of it. Now, the conversation ends with the mayor saying that he doesn't want to see Mos Esper destroyed, and this is where Cad states that he has an idea that can draw them out. From here we go to the title sequence, which is in the name of Honor. The Mandalorians are of course heavily based around this idea of Honor, and this went to the point that Mando was told he wasn't a Mandalorian just for removing his helmet. Honor is tested throughout the episode, and whether people want to do the honorable thing and stay loyal to those that mean the most to them. This is reflected in Grogu, Mando, and most of the characters that appear in the entry. Those with no honor, i.e. the Pikes and Cad Bane, end up losing, whereas the ones who stay loyal to the Creed come out on top. From here we jump to Luke's X-Wing, which is being piloted by none other than R2-D2. The shot from behind somewhat mirrors how JJ filmed them in The Force Awakens, and it's a cool way to open the scene after the title sequence. Unfortunately, unlike the end of The Mandalorian Season 2, Luke isn't in it, but we do get a little small surprise that comes in the form of Grogu. He has decided to return to his father, and instead of becoming a Jedi, he's gonna become a Mandalorian. This was somewhat hinted at in the expanded lore, as Ben Solo was officially the first student at Luke's Academy according to the Kylo Ren comics. Therefore, we kinda knew this would happen in advance, so first fan theory right, or only fan theory right to be fair, and I'll stop doing that as that will get very annoying. Now, as for training, I think that he very much doesn't really need it, because in the last entry, Luke said to Ahsoka that he was remembering things rather than learning them anew. Therefore, he likely has a lot of the skills already, which he picked up on Coruscant, and thus he doesn't really need to be taught. He lands in Pelimoto's hangar, and we see the usual pit droids that accompany her, including the BD droid, who may or may not be from Jedi Fallen Order. Pelly shouts out to it and calls the pilot officer, because as we've seen, X-Wings are now used as the ship that the Popo, Po Dameron's, ride around in when protecting law and order. Pelly pulls him out and says that Grogu is a terrible name, which may be Lucasfilm making jabs at the fan reaction to learning he wasn't going to be called Baby Yoda. She shifts down his Barker jacket to see the Mithril shirt, which indeed confirms that Luke is going to be looking for new students. Now, as we know, his academy fell, and this could be because he was dealing in absolutes and making kids choose whether they wanted to hang out at his crappy house for the rest of their lives or go and eat space eels. The choice was easy. 
And from here we go back at the bar and catch the group waiting for the forces of Convent to arrive. Unfortunately, they don't know that he was shot last week and thus they have to wait out for the guys to report back to them. We get a video of the mods patrolling the three territories which we learned earlier in the season would stand back as the war played out. However, this isn't really the case and the Aqualish, Trandoshans and Clatoonians end up trying to kill Boba's crew because the Pikes are splitting their profits with them. Again, these guys lose out because they have no honour, which further ties into the title of the episode. 88 introduces Cad Bane and Boba of course recognises him, dunks on him a bit and there's a really cool callback in this moment. Cad says, well if it isn't the Quacta calling the Stifling slimy, which is actually a callback to the Mandalorian Season 2 when Boba said it about Catan and Cosca Reeves. It basically means the pot calling the kettle black but I love that this is a phrase that's used by Fett and later Cad Bane. Now Cad Bane and Boba have had somewhat of a rivalry throughout the entire saga. Born on Duros, Bane was based on Angel Eyes from The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. The Gunslinger is one of the most feared bounty hunters in the galaxy and in a cruel twist of irony, he was mentored by Jango Fett. After the Battle of Genosis, Cad was hired by several underworld figures including Darth Maul, Count Dooku and also the Hutts. Cad was highly adept at fighting Jedi and he completed several high risk missions against them including infiltrating their temple on Coruscant. Always prepared for a fight, Cad carries LL30 blaster pistols and also some breathing tubes which means that he's pretty much immune to force choking. Heavily laced throughout the Clone Wars he was actually missing from Rebels and though he was hinted at in the series, he didn't show up again until the Bad Batch. Hunting Omega aka Boba Fett's sister, he ran into Fennec Shand and was defeated by her. This somewhat set up a rivalry with her and Boba which was also expanded upon in some of the deleted Clone Wars episodes. Cad took Boba under his wing but the pair ended up turning on one another which led to a duel of the fates. The pair shot each other at the same time and Bane actually put a dent in Boba's helmet which still remains there even though his armour has been cleaned up. Though it was never confirmed, when Bane later returned in the Bad Batch he had a plate on his head which he didn't have in the main series. This made it seem like he'd indeed been shot and that the deleted scene was in fact canon. The plate actually appears later on in the episode when his hat comes off and it ties in with the scene and where he was hit. Now Bane tells him the bad news about Vanth but we do get a confirm later on that he's still alive. Kind of figure this out as he got shot in the shoulder so fa fan theory right? Yes we're, go we're going down with that one. Now like me when it comes to a DH'd Han Solo, Bane can't really keep his mouth closed as he also tells him about the pikes killing the Tuscans. He also clearly wants to get him riled up so that he can take him down whilst he's thinking irrationally but Boba refuses to engage with him and though Bane says he's going soft, it's the smarter route to take. As much as people are kind of hating on how restrained Boba is, I think that it shows maturity and how he's only fighting when necessary as he's seen the fallout that can be caused from this. Across town the three families ambush Boba's forces and though we thought that would only happen when pigs fly, they actually take out the Gamorians. Black Chrysanthemum doesn't hold up too well either and this leaves the mods fighting the Aqualish. Shan arrives to save the day and using her sniper she blasts one of them into a moisture container which is it an aqua pun Aqualish? I don't know but moving on. Now Mando decides to remain with Boba because he buys into the Bantha fodder of the Creed and though Fett was never raised amongst the Mandalorians, deep down he does too. They decide to both die in the name of honour which hey that's the name of the episode. See you get the best easter eggs here. Now the Major Dormo says he can negotiate their safe passage off world but Boba refuses to do this. This somewhat juxtaposes his comments earlier in the season when he was captured by the Tuscans. All that he wanted to do was travel to Anchor Head and escape but instead he's made a home for himself here showing how much he's grown. He sends a Major Dormo out to negotiate nothing on his behalf and the guy mentions Obadiah several times which is actually the homeworld of the Pikes. He also brings up the flowered fields of Tatooine which according to the history of the planet is what it used to look like before it was turned into a harsh desert. The Tuscans have mentioned this before and it's what Boba wishes to see the planet return to. As we've discussed in several of our videos, George Lucas took a lot of inspiration from Dune and the desert planet Arrakis was also a lush tropical habitat until it was harvested for spice. It very much mirrors that story and just in the same way that an off-worlder came to the planet and saved it in Paul, Boba wishes to do the same thing. This negotiation is of course a distraction and Boba and Mando fly in on their jetpacks taking the pikes out. We get some of the classic weapons used by them including the whistling birds which have popped up in the Mandalorian. They hit one guy more times than you should hit that like button and it's nice to see Fett actually doing something for once. The people of Freetown arrive in a V35 speeder which you may also recognise from A New Hope. 
Driving it is the weak way bartender, played by W. L. Brown, who shut up in Edward alongside Timothy Oliphant. They have such good attention to detail in this moment, and you can actually see the reflection of the area in Mando's helmet, even though it's CGI. I don't know if they paid the same attention to Cad Bane, as I'm pretty sure that you can catch the reflection of the studio in his eyes, but at least they've done this year to kind of flesh out the world. The mods arrive, and there's a final shootout in the middle of the town that feels like it was ripped right out of the ending of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. The group get a minor victory until some Scorponek droids arrive, and it all goes down. Now these are pretty much the next model up from the Droidicus that we saw in the prequel trilogy, and they can completely devastate an area in a matter of seconds. It feels like they're based on Ed209 from Robocop, and shout out Simon A. Berman on Twitter for sending that comparison across. They put their shields up like the original Droidicus did, and even the Jedi realised that they had no chance with these. Boba tries to use his jetpack rocket to no avail, and not even the Dark Saber can cut through the barrier. Now both Mando and Sabine have found the Darksaber to be heavy and difficult to use, but what makes it so heavy? Spoilers. Well in Star Wars Rebels Season 3 Episode 15, Kanan trains Sabine and he explained why. He said that your thoughts and actions become energy that flows through the crystals, and because of this you're able to wield it. As someone is trained in using the Darksaber and they focus their thoughts, it becomes lighter and easier to use. To properly wield the blade, one must understand themselves and be clear of mind so that they can control it and focus their mind into the energy. This is why Mando found it difficult to wield as his mind was unfocused, but after Grogu shows up, he finds it a lot easier. Mando was fighting against the blade instead of fighting against his opponent, but Grogu being here will now put things to rights. This might even let him go forward and become the leader of Mandalore, but we'll have to wait until Season 3 to see if that plays out. Now luckily the Scorpion X are worse shots than Stormtroopers, and Chrysanthemum almost breaks the shield. In the comics, when he was taken in by the Zonti brothers, they filled his hands with metal in order to make him have permanent knuckle dusters. At one point he was electrocuted when punching C-3PO, I think because of this he's decided to wear these external knuckle dusters with a charge running through them. Much in the same way that in Dune, one must move slowly to break a shield, he tries to push through it, but the Scorponek just brushes him to the side, and he retains his title of being the least valuable player. Pelly arrives in a rickshaw, and you might recognise this as being something that Padme and Anakin rode on during Attack of the Clones. It also appeared in Episode 3, and is one of the best ways to get around on Tatooine. With her, she's brought the little lad who jumps into his father's arms, and they've probably had the most emotional moment in the season so far. The Force works in mysterious ways, and Grogu massively helps in the fights later on. The rickshaw is destroyed, and I love how you can see Pelly spit out one of her teeth after the crash. She actually has a big gap in her smile for the rest of the episode, and it's hilarious how they have this little moment. Now when all seems lost, we hear the giant footsteps of a beast coming into town, and yep, you guessed it, your boy is back. Now Boba riding on the Rancor was something that we all knew was going to happen, but it's still so cool to see it in the series. This actually calls back to the Bad Batch, when his sister Omega also did the same thing with Moochie. When it was first introduced by Danny Trejo, he paid lip service to the Night Sisters of Dathomir riding them, which ties into the expanded lore. These witches could tap into powerful dark energies, and they rode on top of the beasts in order to terrify all that opposed them. Boba Taming One is also symbolic on a number of levels, as it ties into not only his past, but also the myths of the Mandalorians. Boba was cloned from Jango Fett, and he, like the others, was very much trained for battle. Like the Rancors, they were bred for one purpose, but throughout the Clone Wars, we watched as they developed personalities and deeper emotions. This is mirrored in the Rancor, who too has feelings, and the ability to form bonds with someone, much like how the clones created their own brotherhood. We also know that the history of Mandalore is filled with stories of people fighting the great beast the Mythosaur. Over time they learned to tame these so that they could ride them into battle, and Fett doing this here somewhat mirrors the Mandalorians also doing this as a rite of passage. The Mythosaur is very much embedded in their culture, and even the symbol of the Mandalorians is based around its skull. Now they triple team the droid, and Mando manages to break through the shield after hitting it with the Darksaber. Though the Rancor is shot, Mando manages to cut off the droid's weapon and finally lower the shields which allows Grogu to step in. Using the force he pulls one of the leg support bolts off and this saves his dad and allows the Rancor to rip it apart. Back with the mods, Drash gets a cycler rifle and heads to the roof, but she and her mate don't have to hold out long before the Rancor arrives and cleans up the droids. We really see how ferocious they are, and it munches down on one of the pikes in a similar way to how the one in Jabba's palace ate the Gamorrean. We get a Wilhelm scream during the scene, and it goes on a really cool rampage. Cat arrives, but before it can turn him into lunch, he blasts out his flamethrower, which is a standard bounty hunter weapon that he also used in the Bad Batch. Fed and Cad confirm a lot about their shared history, and there is lip service paid to his age. 
He's been a character that's appeared in the prequel timeline, original one, and also this one set after Return of the Jedi, so the guy is quite some age now. They do a quick draw that feels like it was ribbed right out of the deleted Clone Wars episode, but Cad easily bests him. He mentions the first time he beat him on a job, and after he was trained by Jango, Cad was very much seen as the superior. He says this is his final lesson, and in the deleted episode, Bane was very much Boba's mentor before the pair turned on one another. Boba is pretty much banged to rights, but he uses the gaffy stick and manages to get the upper hand. The gaffy stick is of course a weapon that was used by the Tuscans, and it very much shows how intrinsic they are to Boba. Though he was looked down upon for siding with them, without them he couldn't win, and it shows just how much they made him better. He apparently kills Bane, and though we do get a long shot on his body, we know that it's possible for people to get fixed up. There's a weird lingering death rattle as he goes out though, and I do think that this might be the last time that we see the character. In the Clone Wars, he of course killed several of the clones, and thus him being taken out by a clone is sort of like poetry they rhyme. The Rancor is on the loose and it rips apart a land speeder, whilst those on the ground fire up at it. This moment feels like it was ripped right out of King Kong, but rather than it being Beauty That Slayed the Beast, it's Baby. Baby That Sleep the Beast. However, Mando ends up fighting it first, and the Rancor puts its helmet in its mouth, which, yeah, we've done enough helmet jokes this season, but there's one if you want it, you dirty son of a bitch. Now before he flies up to fight it, he gives Grogu the little round knob, which you'll probably recognise as being something that he played with and constantly stole in The Mandalorian. Using the force, Grogu calms the monster down and sends it to sleep. The little lad lies down too, and as we saw in the first season, using his powers tired Grogu out. Pelly says, guess it's not going to be a barbecue, and as we saw in the aftermath of the crate Dragon scene, the people of Tatooine tend to eat what they kill. Pelly even had some meat roasted over an engine, and I love this little callback to the Mandalorian season 2. Next we cut to Mos Eisley, and see the Stormtrooper helmets on spikes. This is iconography that showed up in episode 5 of the Mandalorian, and also appeared earlier in the season when Boba passed Pelly on his way to the Pike Leader. He wants to just cut and run, but the other families and mayors have made a deal. All the forces get shot, the mayor gets hanged, and Fennec stabs the leader in the back, tidying up all those loose ends. Out at the spaceport, people arrive once more to the planet, but this time there are no pikes. What we do get though is some pan pike music of the theme, somewhat mirroring the end of Return of the Jedi. There's finally peace and the villagers present fruit as a tribute, much like how Don Corleone was given it by those he ruled over in The Godfather. They now have a crew which includes the BNI-393 that you will recognise from working at Jabba's palace earlier in the season. Instead of the black melon from the desert that the Tuscans had, they now get a real one, and we cut to space to see Mando flying with Grogu in the astromech droid seat. He wants to go faster and he bangs on the glass with the ball, which is when the pair fly off into season 3. Now at this point we get the credits, but the series does have a post credit scene. Whilst this doesn't set up a new show, it does confirm that Cobb is alive as we catch him in the back to tank. He will be back to fight again, and there's also Thundercat there ready to start operating on him. It ends what was a pretty solid episode, and though I often set myself up for disappointment with my stupid fan theories on Kira and the like, I did enjoy the way that things went. I feel like we had a lot of highs, and though it was more action than actual plot development, I think at this point that that's the way these shows are going to go for their finales. The last episode did set things up to make us believe that we were going to get a really crazy entry, and though there weren't any major cameos, I think it paid off in quite a cool way. Now as for my thoughts on the series, I actually really enjoyed the entire thing. Yes, the entire thing. However, that doesn't mean that there weren't some lows, and I do have my criticisms with it being a show. Looking at it as a whole, it definitely feels like two different seasons, and I don't need to point out where the obvious shift change is. I think that had they just called the series Star Wars instead of Book of Boba Fett, that people would have been a lot kinder on it, and possibly they were trying to juggle too many plots at once. After rewatching it from start to finish, I do think that the flashbacks somewhat affect the pacing quite a lot, and though I enjoyed them, it's a weird choice to juggle a past and present storyline and then have a completely different character come in and take over the reins. Now Twitter user Adam Fraser did a great thread talking about how this is pretty much still a Boba Fett show because every character in it in some ways is connected to him. You have Cobb Van who dug his armor, Mando who was saved by Fett, Luke who ran into him during Return of the Jedi, and so on and so forth. Everything pretty much revolves around him and though he isn't necessarily the central character now, without him the show doesn't have any connectivity. A book also defines that it's something with branching chapters and thus it does make sense that we explore other people. Saying that though, this isn't a book, it's a show, and therefore it does feel like it has some issues with us pretty much just jumping in and out of stories. 
I still really enjoyed it though, even if the pandemic affected it quite a lot, and there were several episodes I think were some of the best Star Wars we've had in a long time. Episode 2 worked brilliantly as a metaphor for finding a home and community, and there's been several other entries that have knocked it out of the park for me. In the long run, I'm glad that they decided to do these other routes though, as I think the show would have suffered if we just remained on Tatooine. There was also the technological achievements that the series did as well. The deepfake on Luke Skywalker has pretty much set the bar now in terms of what's expected from digital characters, and I think going forward people will often bring it up when comparing whether future ones are as good. To sum it up, I had a lot of fun with it as I think it took long established characters in interesting new directions, went a lot of places I wasn't expecting it to, and did fan service that helped the story rather than just being a cheap gimmick. I know it's had a lot of criticism but I enjoyed what it did, and I'm trying to view it for what it is rather than viewing it for what I think it should have been. I can't wait to see where Mandalorian Season 3 takes us, and I hope that you've enjoyed the breakdowns that we've done on the series. Now obviously I'd love to hear your thoughts on the series, so make sure you comment below and let me know. We are in competition right now, giving away 3 copies of June on the 28th of Feb, and all you have to do to be on the chance of winning is like the video, make sure you subscribe with notifications on, and drop a comment below with your thoughts on the show. We pick the comments at random at the end of the month, and the winners of the last one are on screen right now, so if that's you, then message me on Twitter at Heavy Spoilers. If you want something else to watch, then make sure you check out our breakdown of Cad Bane, which will be linked on screen right now. We touched upon certain parts of his backstory in this episode, but if you want a full rundown of the character, then definitely go check it out right after this. If not, then thanks for sticking through the video. I've been Paul, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care, peace.